Coming up on this week's show, we dive into the world of Wyborn and Griffin as Jordan L. Hawk and the creators of the Wittershins RPG join us to talk about the creation of this brand new game. This is the Big Gay Fiction Podcast, the show for avid readers and passionate fans of gay romance fiction. Each week, we bring you exclusive author interviews, book recommendations, and explore the latest in gay pop culture. Welcome to episode 261 of the Big Gay Fiction Podcast. I'm Jeff Adams, and with me, as always, is my co-host and husband, Will Knaus. Hello, hello. This episode of the podcast is brought to you in part by our remarkable community on Patreon. We'll have more information on how you can join the community at the end of the show, along with a sneak peek of what we've got coming up for you next week. Hello, Rainbow Romance readers. Welcome back to another episode of the show. We are so glad that you could join us today. And we have got a whole lot to celebrate with the crew of the Wittershins RPG game. But before we get to that, we've got some news. Yes, we do. We had the honor this past week of ending up on BuzzFeed's list of 52 podcasts for every type of book lover. It was a very nice surprise in our Friday afternoon to get an alert that we had been Added to that list, a fellow member of the Frolic Podcast Network and close friend of the podcast, Sarah Wendell, her show, Smart Podcast Trashy Books, is also on that list. Guys, this list has so many awesome podcasts on it. There's a few that I've added to my podcatcher to test out because I'd never heard of them. So you definitely want to give this a look and maybe add some more book podcasts to what you're listening to because, you know, you can never have a TBR that's too big. Precisely. Now, it's a brand new month, so you know what that means. I am pleased to announce that the Big Gay Fiction Book Club pick for the month of October is going to be The Mystery of Brackenwell Hall. This is the second book in the Read by Candlelight series. Now, Mystery of Brackenwell has indeed got all the mystery and suspense you could possibly ask for in a gothic romance, but most importantly, it doesn't skip on the romance either. Here's the author herself, Jillian St. Kevin, to fill you in on some of the mysterious goings-on at Brackenwell Hall. Stephen Merweather is 18 years old, and he's been pretty much an invalid his entire life. His father is a famous doctor who is moving to Edinburgh to start up a practice, and so he sends Stephen to live with his maternal grandfather, Lord Merweather, who is the owner of Brackenwell Hall. Brackenwell Hall is your classic Gothic manor with a long history, plenty of ghostly occurrences and empty hallways, locked rooms, and a mysterious Roman bath that Stephen is immediately drawn to investigate. Stephen resents the fact that his body, his illness limits him so much and he's determined to, to take what freedom he can. In the course of his investigations of the Roman bath, he discovers somebody else is using the bath. This person is Charlie, university student who is the opposite of Stephen, where Stephen is sort of quite serious and mature beyond his years. Charlie is cheerful and very much, you only live once, enjoy it. Stephen doesn't know whether he is annoyed by Charlie sort of usurping his bath or whether he enjoys his company, but he's determined not to let Charlie get the better of him by driving him away from the bath. So this this sort of leads to a secret friendship that as events at Brackenwell Hall become even more gothic, it may turn out that Stephen's future rests on his friendship with Charlie. Jeff and I really enjoyed Stephen and Charlie's story. It's romantic and full of twists and turns that neither of us saw coming. We had an amazing time discussing Mystery of Brackenwell Hall for this month's episode of the Big Gay Fiction Book Club, which is available to listen to right now for members of our Patreon community. The Book Club episode will also drop into the regular podcast feed on Tuesday, October 27th, just in time for Halloween, so you still got plenty of time to read this terrific gothic romance. We really hope that you'll give The Mystery of Brackenwell Hall a try. Hi, I'm Laura Von Holt from The Mermaid Podcast, part of the Frolic Podcast Network. The Mermaid Podcast is, you guessed it, all about mermaids. 
I cover everything from mermaid legend and history to mermaids in pop culture, movies, and TV. My guests include mermaid experts, mermaid historians, mermaid authors, mermaid charities, mermaid tail makers, and even professional mermaids. Yes, being a mermaid is a real job. So whether you have legs or fins, are a mermaid queen or a mermaid at heart, the Mermaid Podcast has something for you. You can find us at mermaidpodcast.com and wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. This past week, we debuted something brand new on our Facebook page called Big Gay Fiction Live. And we hope that this turns into a semi-regular thing that we're going to do. And it was so exciting to do the very first one, focusing on the creation of the Wittershins RPG and its Kickstarter that launched on October 1st. Jordan L. Hawk's Wyborn and Griffin series, of course, is very beloved in our genre. And to see it make this jump into a role-playing game is really exciting. We got to talk to Jordan, along with the crew that is creating this game, and find out what makes that series into something that can be a game, and what it was like for the first time that the creators played the game with Jordan. It's a really wonderful story, and I had the best time talking to these folks, and I think you're going to really enjoy this as well. To start off, I asked Jordan a question that might be obvious for some of you. To get us started, for those who may not be familiar, tell us about the Wyborn and Griffin series and what the world of Wittershins is. One of the things I think that I tend to do as an author is create series, but also create universes. Because I like the feeling that, yes, you're seeing what the characters are going through, but there's more out there that you just don't necessarily see in the course of the books. Mm -hmm. So the Wyborn and Griffin series is a... Lovecraftian inspired Victorian slash Edwardian era gay, well, queer romance series about a uh, gay wizard who fights eldritch monsters with an ex Prinkerton detective <laughs> and falls in love. A little bit of stuff going on there. A <laughs> little bit going there. We have his badass female archaeologist best friend, her love interest fish monsters and other kinds of monsters and sometimes monsters are your, actually your friends and <laughs> it is good to have monsters as friends of course <laughs> yes it can be very handy <laughs> and this series went for 11 books yeah that you wrapped up last fall yes uh, 11 books in seven years now with wrath and rune yes Wrath and Rune's a spinoff series. It takes place eight years after the climactic events in Dessel, which is the last Wyborn and Griffin book. Again, like I said, I tend to create universes, and I knew that there was a lot more stories to be told within this setting. Because within the setting, you have monsters, you have magic, you have various cults, you have people you know, looking for power through magic or just regular ways or just a lot of richness to explore in it. And I knew I wanted to keep doing that. And especially I wanted to bring in the librarians who are secondary characters in, uh, well, tertiary characters maybe in the uh, Whiteborn Griffin books, but definitely have a big following. <laughs> they were um, very popular during that series. And I'm like, they're the perfect these keepers of, you know, secret tombs and secrets are the perfect setting to jump off for this next series. So, And the first Wrath and Rune came out in July. Yes. When, when do you have an idea yet when the next one arrives? Boy, that's a great question. Any other <laughs> year, I would probably be able to tell you. Like a lot of creatives, the going has been very slow this year. So I, my initial plan I had back in January was I'd be working on it now. However, I am behind. So I'm working on a, another Hexworld book. Once that's done, then it is on to uh, Unseen, which is the next Wrath and Ruin book. Awesome. Good things to look forward to there. Thank you. Now, I think when most of us think about adaptations of books, we think about maybe a TV series or a movie, mm. or, you know, maybe it goes off to the stage or it's a video game, perhaps. Mm. Role-playing games are very different. And I think this might actually be like the first one in the genre, the gay kind of gay romance, gay urban fantasy genre that we're in. What did you think of the idea of turning this into an RPG? 
it was actually a really natural fit. And because basically as soon as say like the first three Wyborn and Griffin books came out, I started having people email like, oh, I'm using these characters in, you know, an RPG I'm running, you know, I'm using, you know, adapting something that you've done in this, you know, while we're uh, LARPing or here's a character sheet I made for Wyborn or <laughs> I made, you know, Wyborn, Griffith, Christine and Iskander in The Sims. And they're up in the gallery. You can go download them. So people had already been into the idea of playing as these characters or in the setting. Mm -hmm. So it was a very natural fit, I think, because it was something that people were already doing. And kind of once I became aware people were doing that, you know, in the back of my mind, I was like, oh, that'd be something I would like to do someday in the future you know it was a very sort of a pie in the sky thing it was out there and then when shane approached me about doing this i was like it's no more, more longer pie in the sky it's actually happening and and speaking of shane let's bring in the game creators who are here with us tonight as well we've got shane tatiana and sarah joining us welcome I want you to introduce yourselves to everyone and tell us kind of what your role in the game is. And, and Shane, we'll kind of kick it off with you because Jordan mentioned that you two kind of had the first conversations. I'm Shane A. M. Matheson, and I am a maker of things. Sort of my role, I'm the, the line developer and the art director and co-creator of the system, uh, along with Sarah and Titiana and... I always sort of describe my work as Kalk. When I, I'm faced with a creative thing, I bring together a bunch of really cool creative stuff and I Kalk it together. And so sort of, that's sort of my role. I love that definition. I may have to start using that for some of the things that I do. <laughs> Sarah, we'll come to you next. Hi, my name is Sarah Kennedy. I am one of the co-creators of the system for the game. And I've been designing role-playing games for... 16 years now and working with everyone else in this project has been a lot of fun and I'm so excited that not only have we funded but that it seems like people are really enjoying what they've seen from the system. Excellent and Titiana. My name is Titiana Brown. I'm a designer on uh, the game. Uh, this is one of my first projects that I'm working on. I'm very excited for this to be it. Shane introduced me to the series like a few years ago and he was like hey you have to read this. And I was like, oh, okay. He's like, but you, but you have to read it. And I was like, okay. And then I started reading it and I was like, ah! and he was like, right, right. <laughs> so to get to work on it now, it's just like amazing. That is fantastic to go from an ex a book you were excited to read into like getting to work on it. And you've, yeah, you've got like, some thrilling stuff coming up too that we'll talk about here in just a minute. So as I mentioned at the top of the broadcast, we are celebrating today the launch of the Wittershins RPG Kickstarter campaign. And the really epic thing that's happened here is that it launched roughly 12 hours and 12 minutes ago now. <laughs> and within four hours, it had hit its funding, which is incredible. But even now, I think roughly an hour or so ago, you actually exceeded your first stretch goal as well. Tell everybody what the Kickstarter involves and a little bit about the Kickstarter itself, what the funds are used for, and talk about some of the great things that are available. Right. Okay. So I'm going to very briefly veer into the political, um, not super duper too much, but like most workers in the tabletop RPG industry and the creative fields are grossly underpaid and do not have a stable living. For example, most uh, game designers are not paid for time for research. They're not paid for anything but the word count, and that's, it's just not livable. So I really want to have a big, robust, like, actual salary for my creative team, for whoever is working on this project. It's really important to me. So making sure that the people who are working on it are adequately and fairly compensated for their work is a big one. 
And the other big one is just materials costs like uh, color ink is quite expensive and hardcover books are quite heavy to ship. And, and so basically with those two things, that's a big chunk of change when you're looking at a decent operation. So I'm really, really grateful to everybody who's been backing us because that money is going to be going toward, I hope, um, helping to, because I'm, I'm not a revolutionary and falling into, in footsteps, like, for example, like Adam Jury does really good ethical work. And I think John Wick's The Seventh Sea campaign was very uh, ethically run as well. But I want to follow in those footsteps and you're helping me with that. So I really appreciate that. That and that's wonderful to hear too, because we're certainly all about artists and creatives getting paid their due for what they do, and so it's great that everybody who's helped fund this so far has has helped to make that happen. Tell us about some of the goodies that are available in the Kickstarter for folks who are supporting it. Okay, uh, yeah, I, mean, I could go off on this because my uh, the whole reason I love doing this stuff is I love the branding because I just sort of try to appease the fanboy that lives in my heart that is like, okay, fanboy, what if you could close your eyes and make this thing happen? What would you want the rewards to be? And so I thought the first thing that anybody would want for a game like this, especially that centers on the town is a map of the town. And this artist who I've been working with since I was literally out the gate, he was the very, very first artist I ever worked with in the industry. He did this amazing, beautiful full color map for us. That's just gorgeous. And so we're offering that um, as a reward uh, alongside it. And Jordan is going to sign them. So it's going to be like amazing collector's item. I definitely want one on my wall. So that's the thing I'm the most excited about. That's very cool. And Titiana, hitting the stretch goal already means that you're on deck to produce something pretty cool. Yes. <laughs> Tell us about the stretch goal you're creating as well. Train to Arkham is going to be an uh, adventure. We have also added a couple of tiers now too. So to talk about tiers, every t- my personal opinion, every tier that has character art is the coolest tier ever. <laughs> as someone who plays games, I'm always like, Anytime someone draws a character, anytime I can afford to get a character commissioned, it's just amazing. And we have added a couple of new tiers uh, for uh, Train to Arkham as well, so you can get character art included in that. It's basically going to be uh, another full adventure for the Wittishan setting, although set outside the town, as its name might give away. That's very cool. And I have to say, looking at the Facebook comments, Natalie, Amelia, Bella are already going like, yes, a map. <laughs> <laughs> so that was incredibly the right way to go. And you can actually find it now in its sort of small form um, in the Pocket Guide to Wittershins, Massachusetts, which is currently available for download. And I've heard a few people say and when they download it that they don't really know anything about gaming and i want to say that it's our hope that you'll be able to use this if you've never played a game in your life and so it it would be awesome if you would give it a shot and let us know hey this was great this was confusing and we will we're going to try to make it the most usable for people who've never played a game before ever. So you can go download that right now and get that map in there. Take a look at it. It's beautiful. It looks like really good. Like when Shane showed it to me, I mean, I, I've worked with a lot of like, you know, like, like intro products and, and like products just like the pocket guide before. But when like Shane showed it to me and said, Hey, so I'm going to lay it out like this. And I thought I would see like the rough, like a rough version of it. And then boom. And I'm like, this is amazing. Like, it, it, it's just wonderful. Let's go back to a little bit of the origin now that we've had a, a good moment of celebratoriness. Shane and Jordan, how did this RPG come around? Well, I've known Shane online for a couple few years now, and we met at the GRL in shoot, the one that had the Wild West theme. Which one was Denver. that? Shoot, Denver, Denver thank you. God, I just completely blanked. And then last year, we reconnected and I had, this was right after Dessel came out and I had been thinking about 
like I said, a lot of different things that Wyborn Griffin and my other series could potentially become. And so we had, we were hanging out at, at like the diner, dinner area, whatever. And she was like, so I'm thinking, what if we do this? And I'm like, yes, like that is something I already want to do. So he was like, great. You know, so that's just kind of, it was a very easy start to it because I was already on board with it as soon as, you know, he's like, so how have you thought about doing this? Or what do you think about doing this? I'm like, I am already there, my friend, (laughs) already there. And I have kind of an emotional, like a lifetime original movie kind of answer for this. Uh, When I had encountered the Wyburn and Griffin series, I was in an abusive relationship and I was still in the closet. I'm trans. And so I looked very, very much like a a girl. I was leading a very miserable existence. And one of the things that I was enjoying was a Delta Green campaign, which if you've never played Delta Green, that's another really solid system. But I was playing that and just feeling like very isolated in both my body and my social life. And I was, I just had finished the the book Morris and I was like, this is gay, but I want to go gayer than this. Um, (laughs) Make it gayer. (laughs) Make it gayer. And Amazon was like, what about this gay thing? And I was like, all right, yeah, I'll try that. That looks great. And about mid midway through when Griffin and, and Wyborn are, are talking at Marshes, and i had been like kind of getting the hints of it, the little hints of the what genre we were in. And because I hadn't, I didn't know what genre we were in when I started reading it. And, and Wyborn said that he went to school at Miskatonic. I was like, oh, that's where we are. Okay, I understand now. I love it. And while, when I read it, I hit the end of where we were and immediately started over. I've never done that with a series. I read like all of the books and I was like, read them all again. Because it's like, this is people who are like me, who are triumphing over stuff that I've been told in the genre is impossible to defeat, you know? Like in like the Lovecraft genre, you're supposed to go mad and die. And like, that's what you're supposed to do. But that's not what these people were doing. And it was very inspirational. And it was using that energy that I got out of that previous existence. And I'm now living a much happier, healthier, like truer life, a safer life, because these books gave me the kind of the blueprint to have courage in a time and a place that I thought there was none to be had. And so I thought, because I'm a big, you know, believer in if you play something in a role playing game, it sort of trains your brain to do it. So if you, if I were to, to sort of allow people to experience what, you know, the staples of gaming in this Lovecraftian way, but have it usurped a little bit by this victory, by this queerness, that that's exactly what people's brains need right now. Yeah, I mean, the whole Wittershin series is really kind of about hope, about building your community, and then using, drawing on the community and your interconnectedness to each other in that community to be able to triumph so that really lends itself to a narrative role-playing game where all of the um, characters kind of have to work together to solve this problem and maybe all of them don't get along maybe some of them get along great but the whole idea is that you're you know having to communally write this story together and the other thing that I thought is really important and special about about Jordan's work that I think we've managed to really well translate here is the villains because all of Jordan's villains like they don't feel arbitrary a lot of badly written fiction especially people fiction writers who politically I would say are not the most woke they tend to have (laughs) villains that aren't really well thought out that are just like they're just doing evil because evil stuff and and I think it's important to realize that the people that you come into conflict with who you think maybe they're doing incredibly evil stuff like they always have reasons (laughs) like 
understandable human reasons. And I think that Jordan really captures what's it kind of terrifying about a human enemy that has solid reasons for doing their evil stuff. Like, that can't really be dissuaded with reason because they are re- being reasonable. Thank you. Uh, honestly, my favorite, not to get off track, but my favorite villain from the series is Daphne. And I mean, she killed and ate her husband, for God's sake. But relatable. she was, I felt like she was really th- relatable. Well, isn't the rule like all the villains think they're actually doing the right thing? So, yeah, because I mean, of their people, motivation. Yeah, people don't, nobody wakes up and says, what's the wrong thing to do today that's going to screw everything up? They're like, what can I do for myself that will further whatever it is that, you know, I need? And, you know, whether that's a psychological need or something else. And, you know, even if they're harming other people, they don't see, it's like, well, I'm doing what I need to do. You know, Mm -hmm. I'm in the center of my story. And so these are the actions I need to do. So, yeah, like no one sees them. Truly evil people, I don't think, ever see themselves as the villain. Right. And I think it's also uh, honestly a, a really important divergence from Lovecraft that you have, Jordan, in, in that because it, in a lot of Lovecraft, it seems like it's like they're mad, like they're doing bad stuff because they're bad people from some like weird monstrous from a monstrous race like let's be more racist lovecraft but yeah like even more but like it, it, i think and i think that right now like what really captures this is wyborn and griffin and lovecraft country i feel really blessed that we dropped right after when lovecraft country came out i was like oh they're talking about in like a way less like Mm -hmm. fun and cheeky way and more of like very serious drilling down to it the sort of Mm -hmm. same like ten one of the same tenets of this game and of Jordan's work is that like the Lovecraftian stuff is sourced from this human interest in greed and sort of white supremacy that's very Mm -hmm. pervasive in human culture now and none of none of the Lovecraftian inscrutable stuff is actually coming out of nowhere. It's actually got like a source and a root in this present evil that exists Mm -hmm. now. Yeah. I mean, I remember not to get too far off on the Lovecraft tangent, but back when I was reading at the mountains of madness, which is probably my favorite Lovecraft story, but they, the Shoggoths are bad because they rebelled against the race that was enslaving them. And it's like, I felt bad for them. I'm like, you show those elder things, you know, <laughs> like I totally took the opposite tact for what he was trying to convey, I think. And so, you know, that shows a lot in like, you know, Horror Frost, for example. <laughs> so Shane, as you were reading the books and then you reread the books, what was in there that said, this needs to be a role-playing game? Honestly, I I actually allude to this in the ash can. It was Wyborn's consistent incompetence at stealth that I thought was very mechanically grounded because I've started because, you know, when you're in game design and Sarah will understand when you're in game design long enough, everything becomes game design. Like every single thing that happens, you're like, how can I mechanically represent this? with math like what and and so when i'm reading this i'm like clearly he has a trait that is just making him incompetent at all stealth no matter what stealth it is and it just very much put it in a game world for me that's amazing (laughs) that came out of my uh desire when I was writing the books to be like, how can I make this scene as awkward as possible for (laughs) Wyborn? Like, is there any way I can make it even more awkward for him? So he literally in gaming terms fails every possible deception and stealth roll because he's just, you know, I'm like, well, that would be much more entertaining than having him be like competent. You know, it's better storytelling if if he fails at it. Incompetence can be so awesome. (laughs) And so much to grow from, too, at the same time. Sarah, when you got approached on this project, had you read the books yet? Or was it a lot like Titiana with Shane going, you must read these, that 
you also were presented with, you must read these. Actually, yeah, it was pretty much the same where Shane was first like, so what's your work schedule look like for the next year? And I'm like, oh, it's got a lot of some open spaces. And uh, then he's like, I'm going to send you just a couple books, um, which we'll get back to that in a second. Just a couple <laughs> books. I want to see what you think of this series. It's been really inspirational to me. And I've been looking at it and thinking about it. And I want to know what you think of it. And the next thing I know, I get one of the largest boxes I've ever gotten in the mail, which had all the books in it. Just like all neatly ordered, all in like the, re- the way you're supposed to read them. And Shane was like, did, did it arrive yet? Did it arrive yet? Did you get it? I'm sure it was shipped. And so I, I picked up the first book and I just started like, you know, just like diving into it just because I'm like, oh, well, it looks really cool. I really, it, I mean, it sounds like it'd be up my alley. And then I think I stopped around like the third book in like five days. And Shane and I were just talking about like, you know, the series and Shane was like, hey, so I really want to design a game that captures the feel of this. And I would like to bring you on. And I was like, yeah, sure, I would love to. And then I I did like my fan read through and then I had to do my critical read through where my first copy is all marked up with love. It's not marked up with like, you know, like like my edits. It's just more like, oh, note for this, another note for this. Okay, just circle this section, get back to this. This is a word that keeps popping up, ask them later. And then actually in one of the first meetings uh, that we had on this, they asked me if I'd gotten to the fifth book in the series yet. And I'm like, oh no, I think I stopped at four. And then I started making notes and they're like, you have to finish the fifth book right now. And so I did. And then I'm like, oh, oh yeah, no, I said, yeah, I should have finished it sooner. Yeah. It was and, so annoying about that. I'm sorry, but it's just because it like the genre changes suddenly. Like you're like, oh, this is normal Lovecraftian like it, investigator stuff. And I won't spoil it in case it's other people haven't read it, but like, Around the fifth book, you're like, whoa, we're looking at a whole different thing here now. Yeah, and, and it was really good. And I really, I was just glad to be invited to the project. And I really love the books. I know I'm like probably one of the newest people here to reading it. But the series has just been wonderful. And Tatiana, we, we saw your reaction initially when you mentioned getting the books. As you were reading it too, did you also see, yes, there's a role-playing game here? When I first started reading it originally, I wasn't looking at it at that length. To be perfectly honest, before picking up one of Jordan's books, I found the entire Lovecraft genre unplayable. I couldn't consume a single bit of it, mostly because according to everyone else that I knew at the time, I apparently was having Lovecraft dreams without having read the books. And I was like, great, that means I don't want to. But I read Jordan stuff and I, I just, I liked it so much. Like the way he explores magic to the way, like you guys were talking about it earlier, the relatable villains and not even that. There was a certain point when I was reading and Shane was like, oh, what do you think of these people? I was like, oh, they're nice, but they're evil. And he was like, how do you know? And I was like, this is why. And I'm not going to say it now because <laughs> I don't want to spoil it for people. But basically, it was I because I like you're talking about. <laughs> um, I was basically because I like them. And I was like, I like this though. I like having to encounter this in fiction, the conflict of people you like being an obstacle you have to deal with, and not even just in a dude, you're being a dick, but it's like, dude, you're trying to ruin the world. I may like you, but you're trying to ruin the world. Lighten up. Um, <laughs> Take a nap, no. dude. So because of that, it just really opened me up to like uh, the genre and also the setting as a whole. And from there and interacting with people within it uh, and, you know, people who are clearly much further ahead in the books than I, um, I noticed what Jordan had been mentioning earlier, which is that people just hit this point of naturally wanting to play within this setting. Eventually, one way or another, it's like whether you're the librarians or you're uh, messing around a different part of town, you want to play in the setting of Wittershins. And I think anything that people want to play with should be made again. I think we're going to have a lot of people playing librarians. My instinct here, but I think that is going to be like a lot of people creating librarian stories. (laughs) Let's talk about the Kickstarter just a little bit more. So you hit that first stretch goal. What's the next stretch goal? What do we have to do to push this into the next one? Our next stretch goal is going to be that $30,000 going to be more art. And 
this is a kind of a tricky stage for me because it's a little less flashy, but it is the like the grown up sort of tier because my heart always wants to add like a full color illustration on every page and all that stuff. But it really, gosh, it does add up if you're paying your artists correctly and with the color, like in the floats the page count a little bit too. So it's like, this is actually something if we wanna do as much art as we really want, as much art as is in like those first few pages of the ash can to get like the whole big rule book looking like those first few pages of that ash can, we really do need that extra 30K. So <laughs> like. Uh. And real quick for people who are unfamiliar with the term ash can, what Shane is referring to is the um, demo download, the pocket guide to the town of Wittershins. Thank you for adding that. Cause I was like, I should ask that question. Cause I don't know what that means. <laughs> sorry, it's also, a, it's also a comic book room too. Sorry. Yeah. A, a lot of games do them. It's a great way for people to get a, like a glimpse into what the product's going to look like. And also it allows us to get some feedback because people can look at it. They can try out the mechanics on their own. And then they can contact us and let us know what's working and what's not working. And that really helps us design as best a product as possible. And you are converting people to RPGs here because Leslie has left a comment that she never played an RPG, but has become a supporter. <laughs> Yay, let us know what you have think. so much fun. Yeah, we, you specifically are. Because when I remember when we first role, like started play when I did the initial beta, for this, the rules are very much like, let's play an imagination game and like allow your brain to like be creative. And I think the people who are gonna get the tr most tripped up on that are the hardcore gamers <laughs> who are gonna be like, wait, but mechanically, but wait, are you sure can like, I want people to know that this is just like telling a story. You don't worry about the rules. Don't get crazy on what the rule book says it's there to support your fun time. So don't get intimidated by it. Just let it help you and change it if you want to. And when we were designing the game, like I, I love crafting. I love the I love crafting games. I love like, just like all like the novels and comics. And so I own like a fair amount of them. And at one point I just sent Shane a list of books that I just breezed through. So I was trying to see like how other people have tackled the genre. And the thing that we wanted to do when we were making this game is we wanted to make a game not just for like people who played games for 10 years but for people who are new to playing it we wanted to make a game where if jordan's at a literary convention and people find their books they can like people who are excited about it can see the role-playing game and then they can jump in and they don't need like years of playing D D or being in an adventure league to be able to have fun and it's a very like story driven game there's like there are mechanics to help facilitate that but the purpose of the game is for people to sit down to think about the kind of characters they make and then to also like make like how to make the story that the characters are going to be in and the like the third thing we also want to do is because the game is all about solving mysteries is we wanted to make a game that doesn't punish you for not being good at solving mysteries i definitely see jordan when we get to grl hopefully 2021 that there's going to be the people who play Cards Against Humanity, and then there's going to be this other mass of people who are with you playing Wittershins RPG. I hope so. I mean, I hope people will do it you know, on their own as well. But yeah, I would love to see you know, people be like, hey, let's get a group together and just run a short... You know, I mean, something like this, you can make it as short or as long as you want to. Mm -hmm. You know, it really lends itself. The system is flexible. It lends itself to doing like, oh, we're going to run something that's going to be like a very simple short term thing that we're going to run a couple of nights over a convention or even one night in a convention. You know, or if you really want to get into it and get a great group together, you know, online or whatever, then you can, you know, really dig into having a longer campaign. It's completely up to you, the mm -hmm. player. You know, we want everyone to have fun. We want everyone to be able to exercise their creativity. Uh, I mean, that's the most exciting part of it for me is that other people are going to have a really cool takes on this universe that, you know, I, that's really exciting to me as the you know, creator, because I love it. I just can't wait to see what people do with it. You know, um, that's just very exciting. I would love to see a Let's Play or, a, you know, whatever with this system, because that's just seeing other people and how their take is and what they want out of it. I mean, that's just really cool. <laughs> yeah, I mean, hopefully that will be an option next year 
So yeah, that would be a lot of fun. I haven't played RPG since college. So it would be fun to kind of get back into that with this game. Yeah. And just to speak to like not needing to have to be super into knowing how RPGs work or having played them recently. I mean, I did play like two sessions before the lockdown hit. I had time to play two sessions of D&D with the local trans support group. And then we all went into lockdown and just kind of it fell apart. But I hadn't played D&D since like eighth grade before that, you know, so that was a, you know, that was only a couple years ago. But it had been a long time. So, but we did a, like the four of us, a play, a uh, live play of it. And, you know, it was easy to get into. You know, it's like, okay, you know, here's my character. This is the character's motivations. Let's go. What was it like for you, Jordan, to, you know, play in this universe, not as author, but as RPG player? And it was a lot of fun because... Obviously, coming in as a player, you know, I didn't know, like, okay, what is the scenario? What is the plot here? What are we, yeah, I had my goals and the background, but how is this going to play out? You don't know. It depends on what other people do. And it's like collaborating with other people to make this story. Like, that's always been something. I've done it a couple times in my writing life. You know, just for example, the Remnant short story that KJ Charles and I wrote, which is free and has a crossover between Wyborn Griffin and her Simon Fexible books. That was a lot of fun because it's the collaborative nature of it, because it's someone else throwing in an idea that you wouldn't have had. It's like, oh, how am I going to take that and incorporate it and then run with it? You know, so um, that I've always found that kind of collaboration really rewarding. And so this is just a different way of, a more casual way of doing it but also like very fun because you get to, you know, play off what are other people doing and what are they giving you and like, okay, well now I have to use this prompt to, you know, come up with my answer. What am I going to do next? And Mm -hmm. yeah, it was, it was tons of fun. And for the three of you, Tatiana and Shane and Sarah, what was it like for you three to play with the author creator of the universe? It was actually really fun. I didn't get to interact with uh, Jordan's character too much personally. My partner, Sherrod, got to play an MC that spent a lot of time with Jordan. And watching those two go at it was amazing. Oh my God. <laughs> Like, um, a big part of it, uh, we had chosen to do a flashback scene just to kind of, like, clarify some things and just watching the two of them. And because, like, from what Jordan said, they uh, he's not played a lot. And I know that my partner has, like, played maybe, like, a couple one-shot games that I've run. Oh, so to see two people who, like, really don't do this that often just get immersed in it was really fun. Uh, it, it was really amazing. The flashback scene was Shane's idea. Uh, that goes back to what I was saying about collaborating. I was just ready to go on, and Shane's like, well, let's play, hold on a minute. Let's actually play that. And it's, like, brilliant. You know, yeah, that's yeah, a great I wanna, idea. <laughs> I want to real quick, because, like, I'm going to be releasing kind of videos along with the Let's Play of, like, sort of my, like, hey, how do you use this as a narrator? As How do you use this tool guide to, to telling stories as a narrator? And, yeah, like, that's one of the big things is, is, like, just pay attention to the flow of the story and think, okay, would this be fun to watch? Would this be fun for everyone to watch and everyone to be a part of? And if the answer is yes, do it. And if the answer is no, skip it. Oh, uh, the answer to this question, by the way, was... Ah. <laughs> that was an excellent answer. <laughs> Sarah, how about for you? I was nervous just because whenever, like, we... Whenever I, like, I work on a project... And we're running the system through its paces. There's always stuff that you never planned for that the players would come up with. And so I was just like making sure I was taking notes and making sure like seeing how people like interact with stuff. But the, everybody else was having so much fun with the system that, you know, I was, I was able to relax. And then uh, the character that I was playing, Lillian, who I love, she's very outrageous, but she's also, she has her own plan. And getting to, um, she was in Wittershins to meet someone specifically to ask questions about what they might know. And then my character's back and forth with Shane, where we're, we both clearly know things, but we don't, both of us don't want to admit it. And that, that was a lot of fun for me. 
We've talked a lot about, do you have to know how to play an RPG to do this? And the answer has been a resounding, no, you don't. How familiar do you need to be with Wittershins going in? I don't think you need to be familiar with it at all. In fact, I would hope you would, it would be accessible to people who have not read the book. You know, just going from, you know, the pocket guide, it lays out, here's the basic conceit of the world. Here's how the game works. Have at it. So, yeah, I mean, that's definitely my, I think all of our hope that, yeah, you don't have to be familiar with the sor- source material to play it, you know. Hopefully you'll, it'll be a rich experience for you if you are familiar with the source material. But we don't want to, like, exclude anyone um, from being able to enjoy the game. Yeah, I agree. I, I'm, it is my dearest hope that there will be a sort of mutual like, feedback loop that the gamers who are usually like, oh, I like Lovecraft stuff, will find Jordan's work. And like the people who like Jordan's work will find gaming and that everyone will be able to meet in a big, fun, queer group of people who haven't experienced each other's hobbies and are getting to experience each other's hobbies and making it their own. Like That's really the dream, of course. But I, you know, yeah, please do tell us if you are a gamer and you've never experienced anything about Wittershins before, please go ahead and pick up a copy. Let us know what, how you think it does of translating the setting to you, because that is, it's a living document. We are going to be reacting to feedback. So if you're like, I'm not really understanding X, Y, Z, there is a certain point that a lot of the here's what the content I want is going to be the stuff we're kickstarting <laughs> like all of the really serious like setting info like a big play-by-play of the whole town and all the things that you can go and do and see like that's going to be in the main rule book that we're kickstarting so we can't give you all that but <laughs> hopefully we'll give you a little bit enough and really the important thing is uh, we've all played pretend and some of us have done like just spontaneous improv and that's really just what gaming mostly is is improving and you have like your character which is sort of loosely your script and your role and you just go from there and i think that there are going to be some people where they're going to be like really nervous about sitting down to play in a game especially a game with an established universe but the nice thing about the setting is that it's not quite anything goes but it's not a setting that's going to punish you if you come up with something that Jordan has covered in a book. And the setting is so broad and like encompassing that it's easy to interact with. And you're going to see a lot of familiar things. You're going to see a lot of not familiar things, but it's, it's going to be a lot of fun. I keep saying a lot of fun. It will be a lot of fun. <laughs> <laughs> in terms of what's been created for the game, are there new things involved in Wittershins that have been created for the game? So things that aren't necessarily in the books? I think this is a good time to talk about the Iconics. As a baby game designer, this is sort of game designer stuff. Something that I learned sort of out of the gate is if you give people a sort of blueprint of what they're playing in your game, it will help you sell your game to them and also help them play it better because they will get to see oh, this is the kind of thing I'm supposed to be making. So we made four Iconics. We have the original main characters, which are, of course, like Wyborn, Griffin, Christine, and Iskander. And then we have their counterparts, the new Iconics, which are Dr. Alvin Barrister, Gaspar de la Cruz. We just changed your name. And so in the, in the play, the thing that I'm sort of hesitating bringing it up, we call her Hattie but her new name is Edie Chan and Lillian Wallace. And those are our iconics. And also there's a new setting called the portent. That's the newest hot spot in town that I made up. And Jordan has graciously allowed the, the portent to, to stay in Wittershins. Yeah. I mean, what so. a great name for something in Wittershins, right? Like the portent, of course, you're going to go there for all of your entertainment and gambling needs. Without getting into too many mechanics of things, What's involved in adapting a a known universe to a role-playing game? Well, for starters, you have to figure out what your tone's going to be. Because just as not every novel series is the same, not every game is going to be the same. Because, like, if you're trying to adapt, like, you know, it's like some other movie, like, let's go pick Underworld, because I've been binging Underworld recently, you would have to tell a game that, make a game that could tell that story well, which is a game of, like, you know, like, 
supernatural creatures, a lot of action, a lot of like, you know, like conflict. You would need to adapt it. You need to make a game engine that makes it feel like you're reenacting the movie. And when we sat down to make this system, we wanted to make a system that was like one user friendly and that you just like could pick up easily. And the thing that really got me about the characters was that within like the first novel, I immediately knew a lot about Griffin. I knew a lot about Wy- uh, Wyborn. And that was what I wanted to portray when we were working on the mechanics is that I didn't want to make a game of plugging in numbers and then you go and have fun. I wanted to make a game where you were actually making a character. And I thought about in a novel, how would you describe your character? What, how would the character describe their goals? So when we were working on the engine, we really wanted to make it more thematic and make it really more like you're like sitting down and writing your own improv. And then that's pretty much just how we ran with it. And yeah, I, for my part, adaptation is sort of my bag and my background. So I think when you're ad- adapting anything, what you really need to do is you need to bear, pare down to what makes it itself first. Like you really have to find the skeleton and the core of the work. And that means usually the broad themes. And so in this, I think what Wittershins was to me when I really pared it down, because it's, you could say yeah, it's gay Lovecraft. Okay, that's a good comp for selling it, right? But it's not really the core of it. The core of it is this power in authenticity and community that I thought was really what we needed to drill into um, and find purchase in to actually construct anything out of. And then the second aspect is finding the thing that draws people about the work. And for me, because this was all in the hullabaloo of J.K. Rowling showing her whole butt to everybody and like thinking about what drew everyone to Harry Potter wasn't her amazing prose, it was Hogwarts. And I was like, okay, wait a second. The thing that is drawing, like, Wittershins is great, and Wyvern Griffin and the series is well, well written and has great characters. There's a ton of series like that go under the radar that nobody, like, listens to or pays attention to. What Wittershins draws people with is Wittershins. It calls people. It knows its own. Like, that functions, that magical call actually functions in real life. And, and calls and draws this real community that actually exists. And like, how awesome is that? And what a fool we would be not to tap into that and, and really, really build from what already exists, the magic that already exists there. So that was, those were my two design goals. What kind of stories kind of lend themselves to RPG? I mean, you certainly, you saw it in Wyborn and Griffin, but are there key components that, especially authors who may be listening might be like, hmm, maybe this thing. And, you know, to that end too, can authors approach you with ideas? So I, I mean, I love adaptation. And so if you've got a franchise that's got legs, um, it might not be a game. Not everything is, but, you know, I, I please come and talk to me about like, I will write you spec scripts. We could do audio, like like audio plays. We could do whatever, but games specifically, the question you have to ask is, does this world live when we're not watching these characters? When we're not looking at the characters that the, 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 the author has put in front of me or the specific scenario and narrative that the author is looking in front of me, does this play still live? And the answer for Wittershins is absolutely obviously, like it has this very rich and vibrant place. And I loved that I I had this idea of like what gameplay looked like. And then when Wrath and Rune dropped, I was like, yep, that's what it looks like. (laughs) Perfect, good, we're good. And it's okay if things aren't a game. I know, I think that tabletop RPGs are going to be a new, like we're in the boom. I love it and I love, what's gonna be coming out of it, what's gonna be coming out of people designing for and marketing for people who aren't gamers, who are just like marketing for the world now and designing for the world. But if you want to have a tabletop RPG, you must have a world that 
has like an internal core that like has a, like kind of a real existence and a place to it and like not all great narratives have that and that's cool i feel like if you have just any kind of situation where people are like hey i use insert a different kind of like system here like D D or Pathfinder or Delta Green to run a campaign in your setting, chances are you've got a game. I know a lot of like anytime like I go into like a new setting or a new set of rules or this they've got their whole book that comes with a full description of the world, the setting, and this at the third. If you've already got a big thriving world as Shane's mentioned you've got half of it done you just need the all rules now (laughs) I think that when it comes to just when people are wanting to make games they want to make stories the thing for me that I would warn people up front is that no system covers everything well I mean there's a lot of great systems out there and there are a lot of systems which can do like a little bit of everything really well but depending on what kind of story you want to tell you're, you kind of have to pick which system will best facilitate that. If you want to run a system that's based around like gladiatorial games, then you're probably going to you know want to focus on mechanics that are more about combat and how to facilitate that combat. If you want like a game that's all about hosting tea parties and the intrigue that can go on there, you're going to need a game that's more built around like social stuff and probably won't be that great at combat. So having a clear idea of what kind of story and also what kind of game best tells that story in your mind will be your best bet. All I can think of right now is what Sarah said, the T thing. And I was like, yo, a doily that gives plus two to AC. My brain's right away with it. I'm like, yes, (laughs) battling T bots. Can we write that into the game just now so we can have this doily? What I was going to say to authors is don't limit yourself. There's well, I, and what you can do with your world and your writing depends uh, on if you have a contract with a traditional publisher. So your options may be limited quite a bit. Than someone like myself who is uh, self-published except for foreign translations. But don't limit yourself with what you m- might be able to translate your world into that people enjoy. I mean, there's just really almost no limits of the kinds of things you can do other than like the obvious, like what uh, Jeff was saying at the top of the show, you know, there's just so many possibilities from like, I, I had a looking at around my office here. I had a fan make some those Funko pop figures and they modded them to be Wyvern Griffin, Christine and Iskander, which is great. You know, so like maybe, you have some really popular characters and your series has enough legs that you can actually go to Funko Pop and be like, hey, do you want to license my characters or something? Like, just don't don't limit what you can imagine for your characters and what, you know, knowing your audience, what you think people, your readers um, would like. Your fans will tell you. Like I said, this was not, this was something in my mind already because people had said, oh, I'm running a, you know, I'm trying to, a Call of Cthulhu game with, but I'm using, you know, we're LARPing and I'm using, you know, I'm being Wyborn and my friend's being Christine or, hey, I built, you know, them into the Sims or whatever. People were telling me already what they wanted. So a lot of it's just not looking at just, oh, stories are traditionally only movies or, you know, maybe a Netflix series. There's a lot more potential out there and a lot of authors just don't really understand don't, re- don't realize it because we just don't think about it that way so just as to throw it out to any authors the audience just don't limit what you're thinking about because maybe your world would be a great game maybe it wouldn't be but i guarantee you'd be a great something else so coming back to the kickstarter I, i'm happy to say that while we've been in the broadcast it has now doubled its goal. So we're over $16,000 now, which is fantastic. The Kickstarter runs through the month, but it ends on a very important date, which is Halloween. But it's also something else, Jordan, if you'd like to share that for people who may not know. Yes, that is the birthday of the main character in the Wittershin series, Wyborn, and also his twin sister, Persephone. So, I mean, you couldn't have planned that better. (laughs) I know, right? 
it, like immediately after Jordan was like, yeah, let's do a game. I was like, okay, so the Kickstarter, right? It's got to end on their birthday. We <laughs> just had to. The greatest birthday present they could have asked for. So as we wrap up, I want to know from everybody how our listeners can keep up with all of you online, not just with the Wittershins RPG, but other projects that you may have going on too. And Shane, we'll start with you for that. I'm on most places like Twitter and Facebook at Your Bro Shane, that's spelled Y-R-B-R-O-S-H-A-N-E. Or you can follow what our company is doing at Libomni, L-I-B. O-M-N-I. And the next thing that we're doing right after this is I'm going to be releasing the first issue of our inclusive romance magazine, Only One Bed. We've got two issues filled right now. We're just working on like the editing and the illustrations. So keep an eye out for that. And there's going to be some really good stories in that. Fantastic. Sarah. Uh, you can find me on Twitter. I believe my handle is uh, SarahStone83. I don't have it right in front of me, so that's why. <laughs> and uh, also, you can find out more about the RPG. We just set up a Discord. So we'll be, uh, you can find the link online soon. I will be sharing it a lot. And it's a really cool place. People seem to be really enjoying themselves there. And then just new stuff that I have in the pipe. There's some new stuff coming out for Star Trek Adventures, so the Shackleton Expanse. And we just, yeah. Uh, you can feel free to follow me on Twitter at Hayes Like Stuff. You can follow me there for updates on my... I'm actually really bashful about sharing this. I'm sorry, this is my first time plugging it. Uh, my upcoming comic, Star World. I have found an artist to start drawing uh, some things. I already have some concept art posted. Oh, yay. Uh, yes, good. it's a... It's really good. It starts a kind of fantasy story and then makes a hard left side. That's about all I can say. And uh, if you are interested in learning how to hone and better channel your real life magic, then you can also follow me, Brewing Witches, on Twitter to keep up with updates about my magic podcast called Brewing Witches. I am everywhere as Jordan L. Hawk. If I'm on a platform, that is what it is. So Twitter, it's at Jordan L. Hawk. Facebook, slash Jordan L. Hawk. Um, Patreon.com, slash Jordan L. Hawk. I'm on Instagram as Jordan L. Hawk. I don't ever do much over there except post pictures of my cats. So, you know, you're not going to get a lot of information there. But if you'd like to look at cats, then I occasionally post cat pictures. I'm also on Tumblr as Jordan L. Hawk. And that is essentially my, whatever my current fan focus is. I'm terrible at promoting myself on Tumblr. I just end up reblogging cool fan art for other franchises. So yeah, so if you're trying to follow actual updates, my website is jordanlhawk.com. You can subscribe to my newsletter there. Again, Twitter, Facebook, just put in Jordan Hawk and you'll find me. All right, fantastic. Well, thank you all for joining us. All of you on the panel, everybody on Facebook who hung out. Congratulations again on such a successful start to the Kickstarter campaign. Can't wait to see where it ends up at the end of the month. Thank you so much. You've been an excellent host. We are so grateful to be here. This week's transcript has been brought to you by our community on Patreon. If you'd like to read the discussion for yourself, simply head on over to the show notes page for this episode at BigGayFictionPodcast.com. And of course, the show notes page is also going to be the place where you can find the links to everything we talked about within that conversation. And thanks again to Jordan, Shane, Sarah, and Tatiana for joining me and really letting us be a part of their Kickstarter launch, which as we're recording this on Sunday, October 3rd, has already eclipsed $20,000 now. So they're well on their way to that stretch goal at 30 k that we talked about in the interview. Now, if you want the full unabridged version of the interview... And there's about 30-ish minutes that are not in this segment that we just aired. You can replay the entire live broadcast on our Facebook page. And over there, we get into a lot more of the mechanics of creating and editing the game. So if you want to hear that part of things, head on over to our Facebook page. All right. I think that's going to do it for now. Coming up next week in episode 262, it is time for another listener favorite episode. Now, in the past, we've kind of kept these special guest episodes kind of close to the vest. We want them to be a surprise for you, uh, but not this week. We are happy to announce that in episode 262, we're bringing you some more TJ Clune. 
Yeah, it's probably not a surprise that TJ is among the listener favorite episodes. And in fact, he has the top three of our all-time most listened to episodes on this podcast. We're bringing him back this week because he wraps up the epic Green Creek saga with Brother Song, which comes out on October 13th. And we'll be paying tribute to that series. Now, also, if you're a member of the Clunatics Facebook group, I'm super excited and a little bit daunted, I have to say. I'm going to be joining TJ there for a live discussion about Brother Song and the end of the series. And who knows what else we'll be talking about during that broadcast. And that's going to be happening this Thursday, October 8th at 7 p.m. Eastern for Pacific. We hope that you've enjoyed this episode and this discussion about the unique opportunity to dive into the world of Wyborn and Griffin. So until next time, please stay strong, be safe, and above all else, keep turning those pages and keep reading. Big Gay Fiction Podcast is part of the Frolic Podcast Network. You can find more shows you'll love at frolic.media slash podcasts. New episodes of this show are available every Monday wherever you get your podcasts. You can help support this show with a monthly pledge through Patreon. For more information about joining our community and the bonus content we deliver, check out patreon.com slash biggayfictionpodcast. I'm Kurt Graves. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next week.